So thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity uh, to speak here. I'm Lucas. I'm the principal investigator of a project called FastR, which is an alternative implementation of the R language. If anybody knows the R language? Yeah. Uh, and I'm working for Oracle Labs, which is the research division, like the academically oriented research division of Oracle, um, which Oracle acquired uh, with the Sun acquisition six years ago. So before that, it was Sun Labs. And we are sitting here uh, in Linz. Part of the Oracle Labs is here in Linz. And uh, the JKU Linz has a long running collaboration with Oracle and Sun before that. It's close to 15 years now. And uh, yeah, it's been growing quite fast over the last years. Now we are eight people uh, here in Linz, eight full-time employees working with, I think at the moment, nine students, uh, PhDs and master students. And some of the projects that started here in Linz uh, are now being worked on by a, a large team of uh, 35 people distributed over, I think, six locations in Europe uh, and the US. And I'd like to tell you a bit about something I think extraordinary that we're working on, um, and that is uh, the Graal VM. And so in a, in a sense, this talk is about our view of the current state of the world of programming languages and about our vision for this polyglot world, as we call it. Um, and it's about how the Graal VM can realize this vision by pulling all the languages into a consistent and efficient system. So I have to show this disclaimer. Uh, of course, this is research. Oracle doesn't promise you that you can buy this anytime soon. Uh, and I'm, I'm not going to give a lot of technical details anyway. So this is like this blurry vision talk. Uh, and most of what we do is open source, so it's kind of moot. Why would you buy it if you can get it open source? So polyglot programming. Um, from very high above, if you look at this polyglot world, uh, there are all these languages. Uh, I've just chosen a few at random. Uh, I've put R in the middle because that's what I deal with a lot at the moment. But you can just imagine your favorite language in the middle. Um, yeah, there are all these languages, and as programmers, we are multilingual. Every one of us speaks more than one of these languages, I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, and if we move a bit closer and look closer at this polyglot world, we see that there are connections between the languages. Some languages can interact with each other. Uh, there are interfaces. <coughs> And moving yet a bit closer, we see boxes appear around the languages, which means that every one of these languages has its own runtime, has its own, its own compilers, and, and some of the languages, they need to run in distinct processes. Some of them can share a process. Uh, there are different rules uh, governing that. And Every one of these language runtimes is doing things differently. Um, like, if you look at the uh, Hotspot Java VM and the uh, V8 JavaScript VM, they are implemented by the same people. They do things similarly because they are both based on this self VM from a long time ago. But still, they are incompatible uh, in, in, yeah, they, they have differences in incompatible ways. And in, in each of these boxes, there's also like a, an army of compiler engineers and VM engineers. And they are creating their compilers and their tools and their debuggers and everything uh, for their box, kind of. Um, and making sure that their system works as good as possible. But there are no optimizations across the boundaries. Um, Sometimes you have tools that cross the boundaries, but this is, yeah, the exceptional case and not the, the normal case. So this is, for a developer using all these different languages, this is a, a real and fundamental problems, uh, a fundamental problem. And 
essentially, you could say that each of these language runtimes has its internal protocol, which I symbolized here with these small figures. And that also means that each interface between two languages is something very unique and something that is different from all the other interfaces. So the, the interface between C and R works completely different than the interface between Java and R, for example. And that also, that also means that you need to learn the interface. And it also means that if you know, I don't know, Java, R, and C, this does not mean that you can write an application using Java, R, and C, because you have this additional level of complexity with the interfaces that you need to master before you can do that. I'd like to show a few examples of such interfaces, again chosen pretty much randomly. So this is the interface, you, one of the interfaces you can use between Ruby and Java code. Um, it's a very nice interface because, well, Ruby is a very dynamic language and you can, the, the Java interface uses lots of magic to hide it to a certain degree from you that you're not actually in Java but in Ruby and can just call Java methods. Uh, native interfaces is something that I have to work with a lot at the moment. So interfaces between a high-level language and C or C++ or Fortran or one of these languages that is just compiled to binary. Um, and here I have an example from the Java native interface, which is actually one of the better native interfaces because it hides uh, the implementation details of the underlying VM and it gives a lot of freedom to the underlying VM. This freedom is bought at the expense of some performance overhead. Uh, as you see here, if you want to get to the contents of a string, you have to acquire the contents and you have to release it afterwards. And uh, in a normal VM, Java VM, this actually means that it, it's going to copy out the contents when you acquire it. And when you release it, it's going to copy the contents back. Because, well, there's a, a GC running in the background and it could actually move the object. So the interface cannot give you an actual pointer to a, 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 a character array. Uh, the Python interface is, uh, yeah, it's also a relatively good C interface. It looks completely different. Uh, you pass in the types with these strings here. Uh, yeah, there's no similarity between those two interfaces. And yeah, that, that so the R interface is one of the worst I know because you have to know so much about the underlying implementation. For example, there are these protect macros and you need them most of the time. Sometimes you don't. Uh, if you know the garbage collector, you can leave a lot of them out. Uh, and then this real macro, it just gives you a pointer to the underlying data, which means no VM implementing this interface can implement a moving copying garbage collector. Uh, and that's bad if you are in a JVM and want to uh, implement this interface and have a copying garbage collector. And sometimes, well, I mean, sometimes there is no interface that you can use. So if you think about the native interface of JavaScript, there, well, there is none. There, there are native interfaces for specific implementations of JavaScript, like there's the V8 API which is also one of the better ones, but it's not a standard. So you cannot rely on the Microsoft or the Apple JavaScript engine implementing the same interface. And this is also a problem, like sometimes there just is no interface between the languages. So back in our polyglot world, you have these languages and the interfaces between them and every time you add a new language, you have an exponential growth in the number of interfaces because 
well, yeah, if I add a new language here and want to connect with all the existing ones, I have to add 11 new interfaces. So, it's a very complex world uh, with all these languages and interfaces. And when you start a project or when you're given a task, you will ask yourself, how do I choose a language? How do I figure out what is the best language for the, for the thing that I'm creating right now? And ideally, you would, you would ask yourself, like, yeah, what is the best fit for this problem? Like, uh, which language allows me to implement this algorithm in the best way? Or which language is the most maintainable? Or, uh, well, which language do I like the most or, or know the best? But this is a nice sentiment. In reality, it's something different. In reality, you're going to, uh, you're going to have problems like, well, I know this is awkward to write in C, but if I don't write it in C and write it in R, then it's never going to be fast. Or you have situations where you, you would like to write a program in, in, in well, C, Python, and, and R, uh, but you just don't know how to connect these languages. So you're going to do something different. And yeah, in the end, there are suboptimal choices with respect to programming languages. And well, there are helpers uh, that you create for making things a little easier. But in reality, it's still the case that we made the choices for the wrong reasons. Uh, and we have to live with them. And so our approach, our vision for all of this is what if you could put all the languages in one box? What if all the underlying runtimes worked the same? What if all the connections looked the same, worked in the same way? It would be far simpler to connect the languages. It would be, uh, it would be easier to learn the interfaces because there's only one way in which these interfaces work. And there would be no optimization barriers between the languages. So even though your program is written in C and R, it still gets the absolute best performance that is possible. And if we have all of them in one VM, then we can build tools that work for all the languages and across all the languages. I want to show you a bit what this could look like with a short demo. So I have here uh, what we call the GraalVM polyglot shell. Uh, I will show you where you can download this later. Uh, it's basically uh, a REPL, uh, a command line for multiple languages. In this case, there's JavaScript, R, Ruby, and the language we call simple language, which is, which is a, a demonstration language that we created. And you can switch between those languages at the, at the REPL command line. Uh, I'm going to use uh, JavaScript and R for this example. And I'm going to create myself some data so that I have something to work with. So this is a vector of 100 million elements. Uh, it's double, so it's about 0.8 gigabytes. And I will need a short function so that I can do some timing. And if I, I mean, I can then do operations like summing up all the elements of the vector, the primitive in R. And I can show you this is rather quick. So it takes about 0.1 seconds, and if you think about it, processes one gigabyte of data, 10 gigabytes per second. Uh, it's pretty okay, I think. And then what I could also do is write myself an R function. Oop. Or write myself an R function that does the same thing. Why does my macro not work? Yeah.
Yes, so now I can call this R function that does the same thing, but R, of course, is a more complex language. So it will probably take more time. If you run this in normal R runtimes, it will take about 40 seconds. But here, well, it's, it's okay in the first iterations, and at some point, it's going to be fast. Well, the system has an optimizing compiler that kicks in in the background. It sees that this is a function where we spend a lot of time. Um, and it's, I mean, the built-in was about 0.1 seconds. This is about 0.17 seconds. It's okay, but we might ask ourselves, so where's, I mean, where's the difference coming from? And one experiment to try is doing the same thing in JavaScript. And we have an object called share uh, that is shared between all the languages. So I can just go ahead and add something to this share object. And I'm just going to create a function that does the same thing. So let's hope this is right, yes. And then I can actually call this function from the R side. The syntax is a bit different because the dot has a different meaning in R. And in this case, I need to know that there is a prototype argument for JavaScript. Oops. Let's see. And it's also quite fast in JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript in this case has different characteristics in terms of optimization. Uh, so it's going to take a few more iterations. But in the end, it's in the same ballpark as the built-in, which was implemented in Java in a very efficient way. So the system was actually able to optimize the JavaScript code uh, down to the real native code speed while the JavaScript code is working on an R vector. We've given it an R vector. Uh, no, it's this, it's a it's a fully ECMAScript five or six six compatible JavaScript engine uh, that's not translating anything to R. Okay. Yeah. But, sorry, JavaScript is compiled to bytecode, and the JVM runs bytecode. Uh, so in reality, everything is uh, represented as abstract abstract syntax, syntax trees (ASTs), and there is a mechanism in the system that allows you to. Uh, combine pieces of AST from different languages. Yeah. So in the end, what's going to happen is that the JavaScript AST encounters an R object and will ask R for, well, how do I index into this object? And then these pieces of code are combined at the AST level. Yeah. I have a, a second version of this here. It's a Another prototype that's based on R, so this is the, the R uh, interface directly. But here, the interesting thing is that I have uh, C uh, as one of the languages in the mix. So I can create myself a C add, switch back to R, and write an R function that calls this C function in its innermost loop. Like this is going to be called billions of times. Um, and again, it's going to be slow in the beginning because it's being profiled. The JIT compiler needs to see that this is an important method. And then I'm actually somewhere in the middle between JavaScript, uh, between the the R code and the native or JavaScript code. So this is the, the level of composition between languages that we are thinking about. And this is the, the performance level that we are going for. Like, I mean, it's not only the interoperability between the languages, but also, I mean, 
R at the native performance is something quite spectacular. Yeah, this is a, uh, <coughs> a ver this is a version that uh, automatically uh, exports and imports all the symbols. I mean, it's for the demo. You wouldn't want it in the normal case. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. So how do we do this? We do this with what we call the world's first competitive performance multilingual runtime <laughs> stack. Um, it's, yeah, our Graal and Truffle technologies that can do that. Um, yeah. Every one of these languages is competitive in peak performance with the best of its class. Um, our Java runtime is at the speed of the server compiler, or faster than that. Uh, the JavaScript implementation is comparable to V8. Um, the, the Ruby implementation is also fantastic. Uh, R is, in some cases, 50 or 100x faster than the original R runtime. Um, and especially, this provides better performance than any other JVM-based solution, like, for example, on JavaScript. And one of the key building blocks for us is the Graal compiler, which is the underlying compiler, which was built for these dynamic and optimistic optimizations you need for these dynamic languages from the start. And it, all of this is based on a JVM, um, and where it makes sense, we, of course, use Java technology. And it allows us to be very productive when developing this system. Wait, what is the actual the compiler? Like, is it the ASD? It's the, the AST and the interpreter. Um, I'm going to say a bit more about that in a second. So the, the second part is Truffle which is our framework for creating language runtimes. Uh, and it's, it makes the job a lot easier for the people developing these runtimes. Um, you can express the semantics of your language as an EST interpreter. So you write an EST interpreter, you create your nodes. There's a do domain specific language that helps you in writing these EST nodes so that you can divide your operations up into different fast paths and slow paths. Um, and you don't need to write a language-specific compiler. And this, is, this, this can really not be underestimated because this allows new languages to be implemented on top of the system much faster. The way this works is that the system takes the interpreter as a blueprint for compiled code. Uh, it's called partial evaluation or the second Futomura projection. It's a very cool concept. Uh, look it up if you're interested. Uh, yeah, so the components of our system, we are based on Hotspot, on the Hotspot VM. And then in there we have the Graal compiler, which is a bytecode to native code compiler that can replace the, the client and server compiler. And it's very efficient um, also for Java code. On top of that, we've built the Truffle framework, which is this tool that allows you to develop language runtimes. And then we have a number of implementations of languages. Um, there's, at the moment, uh, JavaScript, Ruby, and R being developed as fully fledged projects uh, in Oracle Labs. There's a number of projects that are driven by academic collaborators and it's getting more all the time. One of the things that you can also do with the Truffle framework is it has an, an instrumentation API that allows you to write tools that work on every language. The languages have to agree only on a few 
basic concepts like what is the connection to source code, uh, what is a statement, what is a function, a few of these basic things. And then the tools can work for all and across all the languages. And, and of course, you can use this for debugging. You can use this for profiling, for coverage tools, uh, for all kinds of logging functionality. Uh, and we have a, quite a number of, of tools using that already. Uh, this is under heavy development at the moment. Um, I'd like to show you a short demo of a cross-language debugging in NetBeans, but it's changing so much that I'm not going to try myself and do a live demo. So I have some, some screenshots. Uh, this is NetBeans running um, yeah, the current version of the GraalVM, which means that the code in my example is already deprecated. But I've set a breakpoint on this invoke method. And when I start the program, it's going to hit this breakpoint. And from there on, if I step into, the system knows that this invoke function is something that allows me to transition between languages. And that I'm not really interested in the contents of this invoke function, but I'm interested in the contents of whatever I'm calling into. So in this case, the target is some R code, and I end up in the debugger in R code. Uh, yeah, it should show me all the local variables, which doesn't work here. Uh, but if I can step into even further, and in this case, uh, the function that's called is implemented in our example language, simple language, which looks a lot like JavaScript, but it's not. Um, yeah. So that is also something that we would like to provide. Uh, and this is especially interesting if you can also add uh, languages like C or C++ into the mix. And there's a new project that we've just put on GitHub which provides uh, a truffle backend for LLVM IR so that you can take any frontend that generates LLVM IR and run the resulting code as part of this system. For us, this is important because, well, I mean, C, C++, Fortran, but there are a lot of languages that can compile to LLVM IR. So I said that this is something that you can try. Uh, there's different versions of this. Like, you can download the source code of all the individual projects uh, and compile it yourself. And we provide a binary that provides a, a unified image that contains all the languages, the, the first uh, tool I used in the demo. Uh, it's actually an awesome Java VM because, well, it has an awesome Java compiler uh, with great peak performance. Uh, and this Graal compiler is especially good at compiling something like Scala code. Because Scala code adds all these abstractions and overhead, and we are good at removing these abstractions. And it con this image contains, uh, at the moment, the R, Ruby, JavaScript, and the SL, simple language, our toy language implementation to try out. It's going to be updated in the next days because the version that's currently online is ancient. I think it's from October. Uh, yeah, but if you're interested, go there or just Google GraalVM OTN and you will find it. Uh, the repositories for the rest mostly on GitHub under the GraalVM uh, project and Ruby, the Truffle Ruby is actually part of the official Ruby, JRuby runtime uh, developed there. Graal is at the moment an OpenJDK project and all of this is open source as you can see. Under which license? Well, GPL. I mean, it's the, the OpenJDK stuff uh, anyway, and yeah, I think the example language is, is BSD something. Yeah. Uh, I understand correctly that you update these projects like in chunks every month or something. It's not like in ah no no, it's only the the OTN thing is updated in larger intervals because there's some legal bahoo we have to go through. Uh, these are like yeah. Life. Uh, 
repositories. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so, and I'm already finished with enough time for questions. The one thing that I'd like to say here is also that the ambitions of this are very high. It's not just about this interoperability between the languages. Every one of these languages is aiming to be the, the best and awesomest implementation of the language that you can get. Uh, and then you have this interoperability added on top of that, which makes for a, a pretty amazing uh, package of technology. And yeah, maybe some of you will add a language at some point. Would be nice. Uh, we have, I think there was a closure implementation, which is, I think, a functional JVM-based language. Uh, yeah, some of the languages have tail calls. It's not implemented at the, at the VM level. It's implemented at the language level. Um, but that doesn't really make a difference. Yes, there are languages there that have tail calls. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. Based on traffic, I mean, the implementation, when you say there's a Merlin implementation for uh, Haskell implementation, you mean that there is a Truffle DSL for Haskell or for this particular language? That's the there, is, there is a project that allows you to run uh, Erlang code on the Truffle framework, uh, like in this system. Yes. Uh, it's not a specific DSL uh, at the truffle level. Uh, it's just uh, something that parses Erlang and creates the right nodes in the AST. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the thing is, uh, at some point, source code is parsed, and at that point, AST is created. And when the system starts running your code, it will execute, interpret this AST. So this AST is going to run for a while until it detects, okay, this is a hot piece of code. And then, uh, yeah, it's going to use the interpreter and the AST and combine the execute methods of the interpreter in such a way that they make up the actual code. This is not done at the bytecode level, but it's done by the Graal compiler. Okay, so it's directed in the compilation. Yes, yes. But so that means if you, have, if you want to use any base class library, like the Java base class library, you have, you have to do all of this for the whole source. You cannot use any pre-compiled bytecode level implementation of that. Yeah, I mean, you can, you can always call out to Java code from this system. So uh, it's... So the, the thing is, there's um, an interoperability layer that allows you to interoperate with Java um, so that you can call Java methods, use Java objects. Uh, at the moment, this, this thing is implemented using reflection, so it's quite slow. Um, but at some point, we will create a, uh, probably something that create, creates bytecodes. And there's a different project that implements a bytecode runtime on top of Truffle. And if you use that, then all the Java code is a part of the system as everything else. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we, we always started the source code. The thing is, we did some experiments with uh, serializing out the ASTs and stuff. 
but it's very hard to get that faster than an actual source code parser. Um, and I, I don't know, is there something to pre-compile Ruby code? Probably not. Well, no, well, in the context of transfer. Yeah. yeah. No, at the moment, we don't see uh, a reason to, to start from something else. Okay. Any? I, I don't know. Yeah. So, the Graal compiler is actually integrated in OSPOR, like for all the garbage collection algorithm, it's like it inserts uh, save points and, and everything like C2 does. Or yes. C1. Yes. The, the story is um, so the compiler needs to talk to the VM and it needs to agree with the VM on certain things, like how does a write barrier work. And there is an interface called the JVMCI, the Java VM Compiler Interface, um, which is the interface we've introduced. And this is starting, well, the newest uh, JDK 9 early access builds actually contain this interface. Um, and yes, Graal creates the write barriers for all the GCs and everything. Yes, yes. It was called Graal API at some point. <laughs> okay, if there are no more questions, then thanks for your attention. <laughs>